yeast puffs up bread and ferments beer. But for scientists at Ginkgo Bioworks in Boston, the microbes are taking them back more than a century to resurrect, for the first time ever, the scent of an extinct flower. The researchers started with a species of Hawaiian mountain hibiscus that went extinct in 1912. Taking a small piece of a preserved specimen, the scientists planned to use the flower's DNA to reconstruct the plant's fragrant molecules. There was only one problem. When an organism has been dead for a long time, its DNA starts to break down into many pieces, like a jigsaw puzzle. So the scientists at Ginkgo turned to a paleogenomics lab for help. Like paleontologists assembling ancient bones, scientists working in paleogenomics pieced together old fragments of DNA. Using similar DNA sequences as clues, the scientists were able to digitally assemble the genetic code for enzymes that make the extinct flowers fragrance molecules. A special printer converted the recovered sequences into physical DNA, which was then plugged into yeast, turning the organism into a fragrance factory. A scent artist created 11 different combinations of the identified fragrance molecules, blending together predictions of what the flower might have smelled like and giving the scientists at Ginkgo a glimpse, or whiff, into the past. After the scientists got their first sniff of the 11 different fragrance blends, we asked, what was it like to smell an extinct flower? If you think about the goal of this, pro this project, they're not re resurrecting a plant, they're letting you interact with the ghost of this plant. Like just, you're just getting a little evanescent whiff of part of the essence of this plant that's no longer with us. So whatever that smell is, it should make you think about the, pl the thing that's gone, which is basically what ghosts always do. I just feel really overwhelmed now, having been sitting with the smells for a long time. Um, but it was really cool to see how, yeah, that, that list of molecular names in a spreadsheet was translated into those different experiences. And they ranged from really delicate and floral to really spicy, and I had two favorites, one of the spicy category and one of the more floral category. There was several that were that kind of had floral, citrusy, lavender qualities that um, I thought were very captivating. Of the spicy ones, it was more, it was almost volcanic, right? There was like a volcanic flavor that was immediate and, uh, you know, that's where the, this plant grew back, back in the day when it was alive. One of the main compounds that I was really excited about was uh, beta caryophylline, which has like a, a woody, uh, peppery uh, aroma to it. The, the strongest one, the one that went on to like the, the campfire side, yeah, as we've been sitting out there, people are saying like, oh, you should call this one Smokehouse. <laughs> I'm just going to smell it one more time. <laughs> so what else is on the resurrection wish list? I did spend a little bit of time looking into what it would take to make, um, like if elephants have musk, <laughs> so that if I could do um, the woolly mammoth smell. I've, I, want, I want to smell a saber-toothed tiger's musk because I picture it being like really scary musk. So I would really like to go back and be able to reconstruct what the primordial soup looked like when, the, when you have the first organisms, right, that, that became alive. And I think that would be awesome, right, because that would really tell us, like, how life started. I'm a proponent of sequencing, so, you know, the motto of my team is sequence all the things. So the more genome sequences we have, right, of everything, the more we can actually reconstruct the path to, from, you know, billion, four billion years ago to now. Read Ghost Flowers by Rowan Jacobson in Scientific American's February 2019 issue.